Thank you very much. Um, I've just come from Europe. And uh, Europe today is a, a continent in a bit of turmoil. My own country, Great Britain, is going through the, um, the kind of exercise that you people went through back in the 1770s. We're fighting for our independence from Europe in an exercise called Brexit, which is not proving as simple as maybe some people originally thought. And you may have seen, have you seen the, uh, the troubles that are taking place in Paris? The demonstrations, the rioting. I was talking to uh, the Prime Minister of Israel recently about that and I suggested to him he might like to convene a conference in Jerusalem to talk about peace between the two sides in Paris. I thought perhaps even uh, maybe let's take our embassies out of Paris and uh, try and calm the situation down until the two sides get used to it because the capital city of France is not probably the best place to have your embassy right now. Um, ladies and gentlemen, I want to start off with um, reading you a speech that I made and don't worry, it's not a long speech. I made in the United Nations in Geneva in May of this year. And this was at an emergency session of the United Nations Human Rights Council discussing the aggression, the aggression by the Israel Defense Force against peaceful demonstrators on the Gaza border. And just by way of context, I'd sat through most of the day in the Human Rights Council listening to speech after speech after speech condemning the state of Israel. And only three countries spoke in favor of the state of Israel. And one of those was, of course, the state of Israel. You wouldn't expect them to condemn themselves. And of course, your great country, and thirdly, Australia. All of the other countries really pretty much condemned Israel to one extent or another. And these were the words that I said to them. I said, I commanded British troops in Afghanistan, Iraq, the Balkans, and Northern Ireland and serve with NATO and the United Nations. I have come straight from the Gaza front line to share my assessment. Based on what I observed, I can say that everything we have just heard here today is a complete distortion of the truth. The truth is that Hamas, a terrorist organization that seeks the destruction of Israel and the murder of Jews everywhere deliberately caused over 60 of its own people to get killed. They sent thousands of civilians to the front line as human shields for terrorists trying to break through the border. Hamas's goal, in their own words, was blood in the path of jihad. I ask every country in this council You've all been telling us that Israel should have reacted differently, but how would you respond if a jihadist terror group sent thousands to flood your borders and gunmen to massacre your communities? Your failure to admit that Hamas is responsible for every drop of blood spilt on the Gaza border encourages their violence and their use of human shields. It makes you complicit in further bloodshed. If Israel had allowed these mobs to break through the fence, the IDF would then have been forced to defend their own civilians from slaughter, and many more Palestinians would have been killed. Israel's actions therefore saved lives of Gazans, and if this council really cared about human rights, it should commend the Israel Defense Force for that, not condemn them on the basis of lies. Ladies and gentlemen, my remarks did not go down very well. I, um, I also, in one or two places, have 
recommended that the IDF perhaps be awarded the Nobel Peace Prize, but I'm not overly confident of that happening either. <laughs> how did I know all of that? Well, I'll tell you how I knew it. I spent time. I, I had the, the, the honor of being at the opening of the United States Embassy in Jerusalem, and I went straight from there. I went straight from there to the to the front line at Gaza, and I didn't uh, locate myself where the press were in the vantage points along the border there, but I was allowed by the IDF to go right down to the very front line where the snipers were, where the commanders were, and where the observers were, and see it all myself firsthand, see the tactics being used by Hamas, and see the defensive tactics being used by the Israel Defense Force. Ladies and gentlemen, I have, I have commanded British forces facing similar situations, facing violent rioters with terrorists intermingled between them with rifles, machine guns, sniper rifles, explosive devices, intent on using those crowds to shield themselves and then seek an opportunity to kill my soldiers and to kill innocent civilians. So I know what that's all about and I know what they were trying to do and I saw it with my own eyes. And many people I've spoken to have said um, well, the Israelis should have done it differently. And I can see why they might say that, because people who perhaps don't concentrate too closely get told that the Palestinians, the Gazans, led by Hamas, were carrying out peaceful demonstrations, when in fact it was a pre-planned violent military operation to break through the border, to, to cross maybe 400 meters of ground and get into some of the Israeli communities close by the border and slaughter everything they could find there. Women, children, men asleep in their beds, what, doing whatever they were doing, going about their business. They wanted to get there and slaughter them. And so, of course, the IDF had no option but to prevent that. And as I said to the UN Human Rights Council, if they'd broken through that border, if they'd succeeded in getting through, there is no way they'd have got to those communities. There is no possibility the IDF would have allowed them to, got, to get to those communities. But to stop them, they would have had to kill huge numbers, far more than they had to kill. But people said to me they shouldn't have done it that way, they should have done it a different way. And I've said to people, and this includes some pretty experienced military officers from Europe, I've said to them, so please tell me what should they have done? Silence. Because nobody has a, a solution. There is no solution apart from what the Israelis did. There are non-lethal methods. They use non-lethal methods. There are other non-lethal methods. They didn't use them because they wouldn't have worked. They are currently building a massive border wall which goes both up a huge distance and down into the ground a huge distance to stop the tunnels. When, when that wall is complete, it'll be a different story, but it's not complete now, and the story is that the IDF have to do what they have to do. Um, I, I, when I was at the UN Human Rights Council, I, um, in between the various speeches when there were lulls, I went around and spoke to some of the UN ambassadors there who'd made these speeches condemning Israel. And I wasn't confrontational with them. I went to them and spoke to them and said, you said this, what did you actually mean by it? What was the meaning of those words? Because that's not how I see it, and that's not how I saw it. And I was quite staggered by the, the level of, and I, I think genuinely the level of ignorance among these politicians. And these are ambassadors for, for European countries and other Western countries, as well as Arab countries and African countries. They're, they're ambassadors, hugely well paid, fleets of black Mercedes sitting outside waking, waiting to whisk them away to the, the nightclub or wherever they're going after having um, condemned Israel in the council. And it, and it struck me then when I was talking to them that actually this is, this is an area that we do need to work on more. That is actually talking to them. Because when I spoke to them and explained to them the reality, they weren't totally opposed to what I was saying. Some of them, of course, had no time for it, but, but others did. And I think this is where some of the work that LNET does is so important because these people, above all, need to be educated. That's not to say that they're not going to follow the line that's coming out of their embassies, but there is a, a real need for education among some of these highly paid representatives of their country. When I was in New York, I had the pleasure of being um, with, with LNET um, 
with Lee Rosenblum in, in New York uh, yesterday and the day before. And somebody said to me um, in, in a question and answer session, they said to me, why are there not more Colonel Kemp's? And I, my immediate answer was that my wife would be horrified at that idea. <laughs> Absolutely horrified, and rightly too. But it did give me the chance to speak a little bit about my favorite subject, which is me. Um, so what I, what I said to them, actually, is that um, there are quite a lot of Colonel Kemp's in the British Army, um, and, and also in other European armies. There are people who feel and, and I say most British soldiers and, and retired soldiers feel about Israel exactly the same way as I do. They believe exactly what I believe because these are not people who just sit and listen to what the BBC tells them. These are people who have fought the same enemy as the IDF fight. They fought in Afghanistan, they fought in Iraq, they fought in other countries, and they've used the same tactics as the IDF use. And so they, 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 they see things the same way as I do. But if you're serving in the um, British Army or other European armies, you can't speak out. Um, and if you, you cease to serve, why would you speak out? Because if you put your head above the parapet on this subject, it gets very quickly shot at. Um, and most soldiers have spent their entire life getting shot at in one way or the other and don't want to do it again. And in the British Army, um, many, many people traditionally will work in the security industry and often will um, we'll be working for Arab countries like Saudi Arabia or the UAE, and the two things don't sit comfortable. If you want to earn a living in the security industry, you don't say nice things about Israel. But there is also a very long tradition of British army officers supporting the Jewish state. And actually one of them was, lived here in Los Angeles and was buried here in Los Angeles as well. His name is Lieutenant Colonel Jonathan Patterson, who commanded the, the first formed Jewish fighting force since the Maccabees. He formed it. He was a Christian British Army officer. He formed it in 1917. And it was called the Jewish Legion. It was part of the British Army. And they fought at the Battle of Megiddo in 1918, which was one of the decisive battles involved in kicking the Turks out of the land of Palestine. Um, and Patterson actually... When he was over here, he became quite close with a gentleman by the name of Benzion Netanyahu, who um, was the father of the current prime minister. And he came, became so close that Benzion Netanyahu named his firstborn son, Jonathan, after Lieutenant Colonel Jonathan Patterson, Yoni Netanyahu, who was the, the Jewish equivalent, I don't know what it is, of godfather. Um, and uh, the prime minister of Israel today has a little silver... Um, cup that was presented to Yoni Netanyahu by his godfather Jonathan Patterson um, when he, whatever the equivalent of being baptized is, I, I, I'm afraid I'm a Catholic so I don't understand all of the Jewish rituals, although I have been educated over the years in some of them. Um, it involves a knife, I believe, or something like that. Um, and, and of course, this, this fought, fighting force was fighting in, um, in the British Army in the land of Palestine in 1917 and 1918. Um, they, they, their cap badger was the menorah with the word Kadima underneath it. For those of you who don't speak as much Hebrew as I do, that means forward. They had, a, they had the Star of David on their shoulder of their British Army uniforms, and their regimental march was the Hatikva. Um, so they were a pretty Zionist organization. And, um, and, of course, the other thing we shouldn't forget is that um, almost exactly to the day, 101 years ago, the Battle of Jerusalem was going on. Um, on the 6th of November, the first major contacts had occurred around the, 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 near the town of Jerusalem, which led uh, on the 8th of November, of December rather, to the surrender of the Turkish garrison um, in Jerusalem, and then on the 11th of, no of December, um, General Allenby, the British commander, walked into the city of Jerusalem, and of course the 11th of December, 1917, was the first night of Hanukkah, which was quite a poetic coincidence with the events that had taken place some years before in Jerusalem. 
Uh, and, and, that, and actually that event, those events in which many British, Australian, New Zealand uh, soldiers lost their lives fighting to kick the Turks out of that country, if that hadn't happened, um, the, the, the state of Israel is very unlikely to have been reconstituted as it was in 1948 because there's no real reason to think that the Ottomans wouldn't have hung on to that country throughout the entire time and perhaps still be hanging on to it today. So, so Britain has played a unique role in forming the state of Israel as it exists today. We've had also some very bad patches of our association with Israel and some things particularly preventing Jews trying to flee from the Holocaust and trying to find a home to go to immediately after the war, things that I'm certainly not proud of. But we've got a close association, and today we have a very close association with Israel, closer than many people think, particularly um, involved in defense, security, intelligence, as well as some very uh, strong trade relationships. Um, I should mention one thing. Is, is David Fishoff here? David here? He was, he was yeah, I, I met him earlier on. Um, he, 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 his father, David Fishoff, who lives here in LA, his father saved the life of um, a young Jew called Simka Unsdorfer at Auschwitz. Um, and I read the, a book by Simka Unsdorfer when I was 14 years old. And he, he was an, a survivor of Auschwitz, thanks to David Fishoff's uh, father, um, and he, for me, was an incredible inspiration for my entire life. 19-year-old at Auschwitz, his spirit, his dedication, his persistence, his uh, determination to survive and to help others survive has helped me um, to, to get through some very tough times uh, in my military career. And I feel I've, I've had a lot of close associations with the State of Israel. And I just want to tell you about two of them which have been particularly inspirational for me. One of them was when I was sent out to be the commander of British forces in Afghanistan. I was, um, it was the first time that I was going to be facing the threat of suicide terrorism. And who did I turn to at that time? I turned to Israel. And I was working very closely at that time with the head of Mossad in London. And I said to him, can you get the the commander, the, the military attaché from the embassy in London to come and tell me how the Israelis deal with suicide terrorism. And he said, no, I'll do better than that. And he got a brigadier general from the Golan Heights commanding an Israeli division. He came to London and he sat down with me in a hotel lobby in West London for four hours. He spoke, I wrote, I turned what he said into the British Army policy for dealing with suicide bombers. That same policy was used in Afghanistan and saved the lives of many British soldiers and is still the policy today of the British Army. There was a second occasion when I, um, we had a, a London underground bombings in 2005, the 7th of July. I was uh, the, the chairman of the COBRA intelligence group. COBRA is like the White House Situation Center dealing with this situation. We were at a complete loss as to know what to do. It was unexpected, unpredicted. We never had suicide attacks in London before. The first phone call I got immediately after these bombings occurred was from the head of station in Mossad who said to me, anything you need, any assistance, any resources, any assets, anything, you pick the phone up and ask for it. Because to, from now, the number one priority of in Israeli intelligence is supporting Britain in this horrific time. Now that is the help you need from your friends. I have to tell you, we didn't get the, the same phone call from either France or Germany, although we did from the United States of America. Um, and, and, and Israel is, a, is a, a vital friend and ally of Britain and of every European country. And European countries are realizing increasingly how much they owe Israel in terms of intelligence that saved the lives of their citizens from terrorist attacks. Virtually every country in Europe could tell that story. And also technology um, that has helped save 
lives of soldiers on the battlefield that's helped us to fight our enemies more effectively. So we're on the same side and we understand, um, we understand things in the same way. The, the problem is, the problem I think the European countries have often is that they don't want to strongly support Israel in the way they should publicly because they have a desire to appease their Islamic populations in their own countries, which are growing day in and day out. And also, they have a desire to maintain trade links with Arab countries, which they think could suffer if they were as strong and as close to Israel as they really should be. But I want to give an example um, of the sort of action that I think is very important, the sort of action that I think Elnet plays a critical role in. We know about these Hezbollah attack tunnels that have been discovered um, under the border from southern Lebanon coming into Israel. There was one discovered two days ago and another one discovered today. And there's more to come. We will be hearing, I think, on the news as the days uh, unfold, we'll be hearing about more of these attack tunnels. The, um, the UK and German foreign ministers have both condemned Hezbollah, which I would say is no big deal, because what else should they do? That's exactly what they should do. They should condemn any country or any organization that attempts to tunnel into another sovereign state in order to kill its citizens. What we need, though, also, we need to understand that if the kind of diplomatic action that David mentioned earlier on is not carried out, does not lead to pressure on Iran and pressure on Lebanon and to other entities involved in this project against Israel, if sufficient diplomatic action doesn't take place, there is only going to be one result, and that is war. And that war, ladies and gentlemen, is not going to be anything like we've seen before in Gaza or really anywhere else because there are not only attack tunnels in large numbers coming, penetrating into Israel, but also Hezbollah has 150,000 rockets positioned in southern Lebanon, some of them very long range and very sophisticated, pointing at Israel's civilian community. And so when those rockets are unleashed, or when Israel gets intelligence that they're about to be unleashed, there is only one thing they can do, and that is carpet bombing. Iron Dome, none of the other Israeli missile defense systems will be able to protect Israel against that kind of bombardment that could come from 150,000 missile launchers. So it's got to be bombing, and very serious bombing. And that is going to result in the deaths of huge numbers of civilians. And therefore, it's our role in Elnet and in other organizations that have an influence or are able to influence to apply as much pressure and bring as much education as possible onto governments that can be effective in trying to calm this situation down and defuse this situation. Because if they don't, as I said, there will be a war and a lot of people are going to die, and including, unfortunately, Israeli citizens. I want to conclude by um, just mentioning that um, Elnet, the role Elnet provides, the ro role Elnet plays within Europe is, is critically important for the reason I mentioned then. It's a matter of speaking truth to power. I'm going straight from here to Geneva, and in Geneva I'm going to give evidence to the United Nations Commission of Inquiry that is investigating what, what they genuinely describe as the, the unprovoked Israeli military attacks on innocent civilian protesters. Uh, and, and I'm going to give them the benefit of, um, of a great deal of, of hot air coming out of my mouth about um, the reality. And, and, and it's that sort of thing, it's, 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 it's diplomatic action as well that I think is going to make a significant difference. Europe is in a, in a, in a very difficult place at the moment, but Europe is extremely important for Israel. Where America is a, clearly is Israel's number one ally, but we know what might happen at some point in the future, perhaps in two years' time. I think the strength of support that President Trump, whether you like him or not, has given to Israel is hugely resented by many people in this country and also in Europe, and potentially we will see a significant backlash against 
what President Trump and his administration have been doing in relation to Israel. And at that point, Europe will become increasingly important. Europe, I think, will also be more important. It'll be more important that we influence Europe the way we want it to go after Brexit, because currently Britain plays a very significant role in influencing European countries in their actions towards Israel. And the, the role is positive for Israel. It doesn't always result in Israel, uh, European countries voting in favor of motions that are um, against, or voting against motions that condemn Israel, but it often results in European countries abstaining from those, which is a better option than voting for them. And Britain's influence after Brexit is going to be diminished there. And that's why it's more important, I think, that, that LNET's influence um, is stepped up in, in Europe than it is e even today, important though it is today. I, I want to um, just tell you briefly a story. I was in Israel last week, and um, I was on the border with Gaza. And um, I was at the point, a place called Black Arrow, which some of you may know, which is a vantage point that looks down onto the Gaza border. And just close to where I was, a, a day before, um, an, an Israeli military bus had been hit by an anti-tank guided missile fired from Gaza. And that missile, incidentally, was originally Russian-made, supplied into Syria, went from Syria to Hezbollah and brought by Iran into Gaza and then used to fire at this bus. Fortunately, all the soldiers had got off the bus, with one exception, before the missile hit. You may have seen photographs of this bus having caught fire, etc. Devastated. If those soldiers had remained on it, then probably most of them would have been killed or seriously injured, but fortunately they got off. One of them, one of them was standing next to the bus and when it hit and got very, very seriously wounded. And a little bit away, there was a group of soldiers in cover, nothing to do with the bus, they just happened to be in that vicinity. And they heard this happen, and one of them, who I met at Black Arrow on the border the next day, 19-year-old Israeli soldier who ran straight to where the explosion had occurred and administered immediate life-saving first aid to this person who was very, very seriously wounded and saved his life. And I believe he's still alive today, although in critical condition. Now, think what that meant. That young man was in a position of safety, 19 years old, and he ran into this maelstrom where a, a missile had just been fired from Gaza, putting himself in immediate danger if further fire had, been, had taken place, which was highly likely. That is an act of incredible courage, and not unusual courage, the kind of courage that I've seen among IDF soldiers day in and day out. It's, it's an incredible thing. They're fighting for their country. As David mentioned earlier, they're also fighting, in many respects, they're fighting for us as well. Uh, every day on the Gaza border, soldiers are putting themselves at great risk. Um, we don't have to do that. We're in a position where we haven't got to do that. But what we believe, what, what we, I believe, can do is to provide support to those soldiers' countries. And Larry said it before, I haven't been asked to make a, an, an appeal for funds for LNET, but I do believe it's such an important organization, and that's one thing that we can do from our safety here on the other side of the world to support that soldier and the country that he fights so hard for. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen.